Hello, everyone. My name is Michelle Chen, and I'm currently an assistant professor at the School of Information at San Jose State University. Today, I'm very happy to be here to talk about one of the most important emerging technologies for library and information professionals, and that is big data. So today, we'll talk about when big data meets library and information science. Here's the agenda of today's talk. Um, I will first briefly talk about my research and teaching interests in big data, so you will have a better idea of who I am and what I have been doing for my research and curriculum development. Then I will give you a, a brief introduction to big data. So what is big data? What defines the scope of big data? And how and why it is different from the other data sets that we have been dealing with? And then we will talk about a few examples of the real world use of big data. I know you have touched upon some of the examples in your course discussions. And so here I will not go into details, but just to give you some ideas of um, a wide range of applications of big data. Then we will focus on talking about the role of libraries in big data. Then. Um, <clears throat> Next, we will talk about some problems and challenges of big data. And again, I know some of you have mentioned about the privacy issues in your discussions, and we will talk about this as well. And finally, I would like to discuss a little bit about the job market and the skill set that is desired for the big data positions. So a little bit about myself. Um, my research and teaching interests mainly include data mining, either for smaller scale data sets or large big data mining, information visualization, and social network analysis, especially for online social networks. Um, I am interested in both developing new algorithms and systems for uh, data mining and visualization, as well as exploring the role of data mining and visualization in improving user experience, user interactions, and organizational performance. So um, in the upcoming fall, I will be offering information visualization course. And I'm also developing and offering a new course upon approval. And that is called the Big Data Analytics and Management. And so some of my current research projects include um, exploring and studying the online reviews or social media text and how that impact uh, user behavior. So for example, the first one is exploring the effects of online product reviews or in general, um, online word of mouth on product sales. And I'm looking at it from the perspective of opinion mining through word clouds. Uh, there has been a lot of research done in looking at the, the effect of product reviews on product sales. But much of the previous work is done through sentiment analysis, which means you analyze the sentiments of the product reviews and you classify these reviews into three categories. And that is positive, negative, or neutral. But when you think about positive attitude or sentiment, there can be many different differences in so-called positive. For example, you can be positive about the price of the product. You can say it is you know, quite cheap and affordable. Then that would be a pricing issue. You can be very positive about the quality of the product. You can also just simply be positive about the brand, so which leads to a simple brand and impression. So, um, so there are slightly different when you think about the positive attitudes. And that is what my research is trying to capture through the word clouds visualizations. So I will visualize all these product reviews using word clouds. And based on those word clouds, we will be able to differentiate slight differences in a positive or negative attitude. So the research is aimed to, to answer some of the questions. Um, is there a correlation between consumer opinions and product sales? And if so, 
What types of opinions have a significant positive or negative effect on product sales? And what type of opinion is considered the most influential in increasing or decreasing product sales? So again, the research is trying to go beyond just simple sentiment analysis and trying to analyze the product reviews through word cloud visualizations. I'm working with Amazon's product reviews and I'm collecting um, 10,000 different products across all different categories and, and of course we need to make sure that the product comes with a sales rank which is a good indicator of the product sales. Um, another example of my research in a current project is I'm looking at the social media, especially Twitter, and we want to know how libraries engage users with social media or Twitter and what works and what doesn't. So um, the, the research is aimed to answer the questions including what kinds of tweets are most effective in attracting and engaging users. And when we say attracting and engaging users, we're thinking about um, the behavior of retweets and also the sentiments that are presented in their tweets. And we're also interested in identifying the tweets uh, categories. So would that be something about event promotion or is it something about a, a, a book thing, um, a new book release, or is it just something about random sharing, community interest. So there are different types of tweets and then um, we're looking at how that, um, the different kinds of tweets and how they're different in attracting and engaging users. And from looking at all those tweets, we're also interested in looking at is there a difference between social media usage and user engagement in different types of libraries, say a public urban library or a tribal library. So um, I collected data from a set of different libraries with a goal of having a, a great diversity in population, demographic information, etc. And if the answer to this question is yes, there is a difference. What are the strategic implications for social media initiative? Okay, so that's just another example. Um, uh, most recently, I've also become very interested in looking at how library services and operations can be enhanced through information visualization. For example, um, how can we improve academic librarianship education through information visualization to present then some of the visualization tools such as search engine and um, citation visualization uh, to help their research guides. And I'm also looking at um, how tribal library services and operations can be done through information visualization. So these are just some of the examples that um, I have been doing in my research and teaching related to big data. So just give you some backgrounds of who I am and what I have been doing. And if you feel interested in, in this line of topic, again, I'm teaching uh, visualization and big data analytics and management in the fall. Okay, so back to our, um, the main topic. So what is big data? Okay, so I would like to give you a brief introduction to what is big data. First of all, sources of big data include complex data from, let's say, instruments, sensors, internet transactions, um, emails, videos, click streams, and all other digital sources available today and in the future with data size up to many, many petabytes of data in a single data set. So with big data knowledge and tools, we can study a wide range of applications. For example, many online marketers have been working hard to analyze millions of actions, clicks, conversations, like Facebook likes, follows, views, and shares that happen every moment of every day on the internet to inform their strategies. So I think it is time for us in libraries and other nonprofit organizations across multiple disciplines to start identifying new ways to sift through and analyze the substantial amount of information gathered um, online and in real time. So just some, examples of sources. 
But how do people actually define big data, and what are some of the main characteristics of big data that make it different from the previous data sets that we've been dealing with? The most commonly seen and discussed um, um, definitions or characteristics are the four Vs, which I list here, volume, velocity, variety, and veracity. So let's look at them one by one. So first, volume. Um, it is very straightforward. We are facing with the big data tsunami. So um, nowadays, most organizations are struggling with increasing size of their databases. And according to Fortune magazine, uh, we created five exabytes of digital data in recorded time until 2003. And here's the interesting stats. In 2011, the same amount of data was created in two days. And by 2013, the time period was, was shrink to just uh, 10 minutes. So in 10 minutes, we were able to create um, lots and lots of data. So that is the volume. We are, we're not only looking at like 10,000 records in the database, but there are just tons of data that we need to deal with. The second V is velocity, and it stands for both data throughput rate and latency. So what do they mean? Uh, we're looking at two aspects to velocity, okay? So one representing the throughput of data and the other representing latency. Throughput, which represents the data moving in the pipes. And so it's basically the, the speed of the data coming into your system or into your organization. So the amount of global mobile data, for example, is growing at a 78% compounded growth rate and is expected to reach 10.8 exabytes per month in uh, 2016. As consumers share more pictures and videos and, and text, so you can imagine the, the speed and um, the throughput rate of the data. So that constitutes one dimension of velocity. The other dimension is latency. Um, previously, analytics or data analysis is done mostly with historical data. So for example, when Amazon provides you with a recommendation list, they will study your, your purchase behavior in the history, and they will, based on that history and pattern, they will come up with the recommendations, but mostly with historical data. Nowadays, the anal analysis is increasingly being embedded in business processes and, and analytic tools using their so-called data in motion or simply real-time data. So we are reducing a lot of latency. We're dealing with more real-time data, what is really happening right now. The third B is variety. And again, it's quite straightforward. We are having a lot more new data inputs and output formats. And that will also enable new data integration and analytical technologies for these formats. For example, um, in one of the textbook that, uh, one of the books that I list is uh, the references that you can find in the, uh, the last page or the second to the last page of the slides. Um, in one of the book, it provides an example of um, slides.com. This company provides order analytics for online orders, and the raw data comes from parsing emails and looking for information from a variety of organizations, airline tickets, online bookstore purchases, music download receipts, city parking tickets, or anything you can purchase and pay for that hits your email. So the question is, how do we normalize this information into a product catalog and analyze purchases? So you are dealing with a, a great variety of data inputs, and you need to come up with something that is strategically useful. Finally, veracity. So unlike, unlike carefully governed internal data, most big data comes from sources outside of our control and therefore suffers from significant correctness or accuracy problems. So 
it requires a lot of cleaning, pre-processing, and the veracity exhibits in both the credibility of the data source, if this is something that comes from a credible um, source, as well as the suitability of the data for the target audience. So these four Bs are the most widely discussed and um, kind of differentiate how big data is different from um, the previous data sets. So again, we are looking at volume, velocity, variety, and veracity. So I hope this gives you a, a good idea of what big data is and how that is different from other data sets. So some real world applications. Again, I know that um, you may already have some discussions on D2L regarding um, how predictive analysis has been done in big data. But here I just want to give you some interesting examples um, that shows how big data can be used and applied in a wide range of applications in many different domains. So the first one we're looking at is how big data can be used to save lives in taxpayer dollars, and especially that is the case in New York City. Again, you can find the case link in the reference list. Um, so in this context, the New York City government has used data analytics tools or big data tools to detect financial fraud and other crimes or problems and the outcomes are notable and very important. So according to the analytics team, applying predictive data analytics toward preemptive government in New York City has resulted in some interesting observations. Um, for example, a five-fold return on the time of building inspectors looking for illegal apartments. And it has also resulted in an increase in the rate of detection of dangerous buildings that are likely, highly likely to result in firefighter injury or death. It also result, the analysis also results in more than doubling the hit rate for discovering stores selling um, bootlegged cigarettes. A five-fold increase in the detection of business licenses being flipped and fighting the prescription drug epidemic through detection of the 21 pharmacies that accounted for more than 60% of total Medicaid reimbursements in the city. So this is just a quick example. Um, you can see how data analytic tools can be used not only to discover knowledge in, in one single narrow discipline, but it can also generate many interesting facts and outcomes. Another interesting example is that um, in Obama's presidential election, um, his team utilizes the big data and analysis tools to help him win. So Obama's analytics team used four streams of polling data to build a detailed picture of voters in key states. For example, the analytics team had polling data from about 29,000 people in Ohio alone, a whopping sample that composed nearly half of 1% of all voters there, allowing for deep dives into exactly where each demographic and regional group was trending at any given point. So this is just another example. And the third one is the personally I like it very much, and that is how big data is used for transforming the dairy industry. So dairy scientists are developing new methods for understanding the link between genes and living things, all while increasing the average cow's milk production. So there are many different ways that people can model the mapping of 50,000 genetic markers onto a dozen performance traits of milk production, especially when we have to consider all kinds of environmental factors. So the dairy breeders have been developing and testing statistical models to take all this stuff into account and generate good predictions of which bull herd managers should ultimately select. So the real promise is not only that genomic data which will actually be better than the ground truth information generated from real offspring, 
but rather that the estimates will be close enough to real, but save three to four years per generation. I think this is very interesting, and it is very exciting to know that um, the dairy breeders are also working hard on statistical models and predictive models to help them uh, help their business and help transform the dairy in industry. So that all speak to the importance of this area and how widely this area can be applied. So what about using big data for libraries? And that it would be um, something of our interest. So here, um, for the next few slides, I would like to spend some time talking about big data in libraries. So the role of big data in helping libraries and the role of libraries in curating and exposing big data. So I will talk about specifically why it is important for librarians, information scientists, archivists, or record managers to be active in big data. In particular, I would like to use one specific big data research area or application area, and that is information visualization. So how you visualize big data with um, two-dimensional or three-dimensional interfaces is the main focus. So that would make the scenario simpler so that um, an example is clear so that you understand the importance of and the role of big data in libraries. So the first example is about information visualization service provided in a library. And um, this example is the Health Science Library at the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. And it is partnered with the Renaissance Computing Institute to build and provide a visualization infrastructure and expertise as one of the key services of its collaboration center. So with this service, researchers can consult and collaborate with visualization experts to develop custom applications to analyze data. The center's visualization resources include a display wall, as you can see on the left figure, with a 10 feet by 8 feet rear projection display screen capable of 12.5 million pixel resolution, which is quite large. And the right figure shows one example that a visual display has been conducted to aid a research on injury prevention. So it shows a dynamic bubble visualization of all injury rates with GDP per capita for countries in different WHO regions and presents how these variables change over years. A visualization can select single or groups of countries and trace their trajectories over time. Um, the ability of researchers to interact with very high resolution imagery inches from the screen on the display wall will provide opportunities for new collaborative applications and research questions. Um, from my own information visualization course, a lot of students actually mentioned the emerging importance of this kind of service provided at the library. So we, if we have more librarians or staff trained for visualization applications or tools, we're able to provide such services for researchers, um, faculty members, and students. And from this kind of collaborative efforts, we're able to provide um, applications, visualization applications that will bring more insights into science discovery, um, problem detection, etc. So I, I personally think this is a very emerging area for um, the library's role in big data. The second example is very famous, and it's Seattle Central Library. Um, it is a, um, a project called Making Visible the Invisible, and it is a commission for the Seattle Central Library, a large, open, 19,500 square feet uh, space dedicated to information retrieval and public accessible computer research. So the installation here consists of six large LCD screens located on a glass wall horizontally behind the librarian's main information desk, as you can see from the photo. The screens 
feature real-time calculated visualizations generated by custom design statistical software using data received every hour. So again, that applies, that speaks to the, um, the volume and the velocity characteristics of data. So this data consists of a list of checkout items and um, including a book, a, a CD, etc. And from the list, they can collect and aggregate titles, checkout time, and catalog descriptors. You can see some visualization snapshots on the right. For example, the second visualization on the right features the checkout items in a um, chronological sequence. So each time spent title enters the screen from the far right and slowly moves towards the left until the whole hour set of items have passed by. The circulation of checkout books and media transforms the library into a data exchange center. This flow of information can be calculated mathematically, analyzed statistically, and represented visually, like we can see here. Um, from a cultural perspective, the results may be a good indicator of what the community of patrons considers interesting information at any specific time point. <clears throat> so these are some of the examples. Um, I, I, two examples, and I hope these two examples have given you some ideas of the practical role of big data, and in this case, we use visualization in a library and information science setting. So back to our question, why is it important for us to be active in big data? Based on our real life examples, I've listed um, three main reasons here. So first, the White House's big data initiatives and policies have made one of the biggest changes around big data and libraries in the past few years. This change of policy landscape has put a greater emphasis on so-called the public access to the results of research funded by the federal government. For example, uh, NIH policy requires research written as a result of NIH funding to be deposited full text in PubMed Central within 12 months of publication. This also created a momentum in academic libraries to share data. For example, Harvard has recently made public the information on more than 12 million books, videos, audio recordings, images, manuscripts, maps and more things inside its 73 libraries. This is big data for books quoted from David Weinberger, co-director of Harvard's Library Lab. There might be a hundred different attributes for a single object, and with such abundant, informa abundant information, excuse me, people can create things like visual timelines of when ideas became broadly published or maps showing locations of different items. Harvard's action also encourages other libraries to allow access to the metadata on their volumes, which could be the start of a large and unique repository of intellectual information. As a result, data can get bigger and bigger. So it's important to understand and realize our roles in this big data era. No doubt a library is a data center. It is a hub where information flows and exists changed. So we can find a great variety of data in a library ranging from circulation statistics to digital archives. For example, the California State Library annually publishes um, California Library Statistics. It is a compilation of statistical data from public and county law libraries throughout the state. But um, you can Google it and find it online easily. But if we take a closer look at the data that we have right now, we can see many of them are in a plain Excel format. And that seems to point to nowhere. It is really a pity that we have lots of data, but we don't know how to make an effective use of it. 
With big data analysis, we will be able to render data in ways that communicate information, answer questions, support analysis, reveal patterns, and facilitate new questions or discoveries. Ultimately, this will provide our patients with better services and organizational operations. For example, for library patrons, that library could use visualizations to present things like current collection budget, ebook, availability information, statistics on library use, and data about the public attendance of library programming. So these types of visualizations would not only be interesting to patrons, but would also provide a deeper understanding of the library's operations and the impact it has on the community. Likewise, such as in the case of the University of North um, Carolina's Carolina Chapel Hills Collaboration Center, information visualization services will also become um, necessary services for many types of libraries. Um, another key reason why it is important for us to understand big data in libraries is um, about how you can provide better data communications and presentation. So second, visualizing the big data can be part of library exhibition of information for outward facing. Some really good infographics like, for example, the most targeted books in a, um, a, a band boot week are especially useful to promote information literacy or library events. Um, visualization can also be used to enhance patient interactions and user experiences. So for example, the library at the University of Edinburgh has its search engine that incorporates information visualization called Aqua Browser, which presents catalog search results in a regular format, but also includes a graphical sidebar consisting of a web of related search terms surrounding and connected to the original search term. As you can see, I have a snapshot here. The larger the text the close, and the closer to the center that um, centered term that the tags are, the greater their relevance to the original search term. So the results are interactive, allowing you to follow paths out from your original search term and onto relative ones. The display shifts and changes with each step taken. And another useful area of visualization in library and information work lies in governance. So the library staff could use visualization or big data analysis in general to present physical information for the library board, county board, or committees. And the library manager could use this result to show how successful a new program is, how budget cuts are affecting certain departments, how staffing levels changed over a certain period of time, and for fund seeking as well. So ultimately, it will provide better exhibits and persuasiveness through big data analysis. So this, um, so far we have covered the application of big data in many different disciplines and especially in libraries. So I hope that gives you, so far you have gained a good sense of what big data is, what some of the possible applications are, and what is the role of big data in the libraries, or what is library's role in curating and exposing big data. Now it's time for us to look at some of the challenges and problems of big data. As you may have discussed in this course, while big data seems to be a great hope for many analytical businesses, there are significant problems and challenges that need to be addressed. And I know I've read through the discussion post that um, some of you shared online, and many of you have mentioned about the privacy concerns, which definitely is a big issue in big data. So here I've listed uh, three common issues or main issues that people usually have concerns about. We don't have a single solution to all these issues, but I think it is very important to keep those issues in mind when you work with big data, when you present your big data results, 
and when you think about the the emergence and the future of this technology, it is always important to take these issues seriously. So first, people are being too obsessed with data. So there are two problems associated with big data. When your data is incomplete and when your data is complete. When your data is incomplete, you can always find holes in your data. And observations based on this kind of data can go astray because what's missing may be very vital to the full picture. So when you have the incomplete data, and if you fully rely or become too obsessed, obsessed with the data, then it can be an issue. Even when the data sets are complete, those analyzing them can easily reach faulty conclusions. So again, even if you have great data sets and great analytical tool, it is always important to also incorporate and rely on your intuitive thinking, logical thinking, um, domain knowledge to help you interpret the results and to uh, conclude the findings. So don't be too obsessed with the data. Whether it is incomplete or complete can be harmful if it, it is not used correctly. Second, um, another issue is the common belief that big data doesn't discriminate between social groups. However, the truth is hardly, hardly. The promise of big data's um, objectivity is that there will be less discrimination against minority groups because raw data is somehow immune to social bias, allowing analysis to be conducted at a mass level and thus avoiding group-based discrimination. However, big data is often deployed for exactly this purpose, to segregate individuals into groups because of its ability to make claims about how groups behave differently. So the potential for big data to be used for price discrimination raises serious civil rights concerns, a, a practice that was historically known as redlining. So under the rubric of personalization, big data can be used to isolate specific social groups and treat them differently, something that laws often prohibit businesses or humans from doing explicitly. So that is a, a, a big issue. And um, ironically, the, the purpose of using big data, like we said here, is to segregate individuals into groups. So how do you actually balance this and to address these concerns is very important. Finally, the privacy issues. And I know that many of you have already had some knowledge about that. Um, big data, when, you, when some people claim big data is anonymous, so it doesn't invade our privacy, it is flat out wrong. While many big data providers do their best to de-identify individuals from human subject data sets, the risk of re-identification is very real. So for example, cell phone data may seem fairly anonymous, but a recent study on a data set of 1.5 million cell phone users in Europe showed that just four points of reference were enough to individually identify 95% of people. So there is a uniqueness to the way that people may make their way through cities, the researchers observed. And given how much can be inferred by the large number of public data sets, this makes privacy a growing concern. There are many other issues and challenges related to big data. And um, I have provided two good articles in the reference list. If you are interested, you can take a look deep, deeper look into them. Um, but again, like I said, when, whenever we deal with big data, we try to interpret the results, we would try to um, conduct the analysis, always keep these issues in mind. Okay, so last but not least, I would like to talk a little bit about the job market in case you are interested in that. Um, these are the four questions that I always got from uh, students and other interested faculty members. 
and I would just like to quickly go through them. So first of all, what skills are needed to work with big data? Um, I would say it really depends on the path you choose to work with big data. If you are interested in the technical side of big data, then you need to have an in-depth understanding and skill set in large-scale database management, data visualization, big data mining, and um, a paradigm called the map reduce, such as Hadoop, if you um, ever heard about that. But it would be also very helpful if you know how to download, store, and process some of the online data. On the other hand, if you are more interested in the application side of big data, like many of my students were, you need to have strong hands-on experience in applying some of the software tools to big data analysis, um, such as trend analysis or sentiment analysis. Um, and you will be able to use those to, to help you visualize or analyze the data um, and to interpret the results. So it really depends on what kind of path you want to take. Um, a lot of my students approach me for interest in um, becoming a visualization designer or a user experience researcher, um, which will, will link more towards the application side. So what types of job opportunities are there in big data? Um, Job opportunities for um, SLIS grads in big data are quite versatile, ranging from business intelligence analyst, um, user experience researcher, data scientist, to database manager. Um, it is a booming market. So according to a recent study of the McKinsey Global Institute, by 2018, there will be four to five million jobs in the United States requiring data analysis skills. Big data definitely falls within this category. And um, I just attended a workshop that um, the IBM Academic Initiative um, provided, and they talk about how they were eager to hire people um, from our university who have skills and knowledge in data analysis. So that is just another example. Um, how can we parlay traditional library skills into the big data arena? Um, I think one critical aspect is whether an individual can articulate, interpret, and communicate big data analysis results appropriately, effectively, and accurately. And this definitely requires traditional library skills and understanding. For example, many of my students have been able to present and interpret big data results effectively based on their backgrounds in reference services, collection management, fundraising, museum conservation, exhibition design, user experience research, etc. So I would say there is a close connection between traditional library skills and big data. It just depends on how one parlays this connection. Finally, just a little bit um, advice to librarians who have been in the field for a while but who want to work in big data. Um, I would suggest um, these students to start with some fundamental courses in big data to gauge their interest first. In the end, this area puts a lot of weight on core technical and analytical skills, which may not be a good fit for everyone. Nowadays, there have been a variety of course selections available online, free or at an affordable cost through MOOCs, webinars, and so on. So I think if you decide to dive deeper into this area, you can consider being enrolled in some of the certificate programs or um, taking some of the free courses, um, which require relatively less commitment but still offer really high quality education. But again, we are not making like a, an ultimate commitment to that. Um, it's just some of the, just my two cents for you to think about um, this is a potential market. It is an emerging market. There are many jobs out there. And if you're interested in, in this line of work, um, what can you do to be better prepared? Here's the references for this talk. Um, some cases about the um, how big data analytics is used for taxpayer dollars, for transforming milk, dairy industry, for um, 
the winning the presidential elections you can find this here um, there is a good book called um, it's Safi in 2012 it's big data analytics disruptive technologies for changing the game it is not a huge book but it provides some really good concepts and introductions to this idea to this area and um, a really interesting article the last reference I list here from Future Internet. It talks about the library's role in curating and exposing big data and uses a real um, case which is very interesting. And for those who are interested in looking at um, looking deeper into the concerns and challenges of big data, the second article that I list here, Think Again Big Data from Foreign Policy, is a very interesting one. And another one from Library Journal is a talk um, that I list the very first bullet point here talks about the promise and problems of big data, which I think is very helpful too. So this is about today's lecture. Thank you very much for your time and attention. I hope you found the presentation informative, interesting, and useful. So if you have any questions, please feel free to email me. This is my email address or um, email Dr. Sue Allman and she will let me know. So thank you very much again.